Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to allow a little time for everyone to join us from the lobby, and we'll get started right at the top of the hour. We're looking forward to a great presentation today. Okay. All right, it is one o'clock central time, so we'll go ahead and get started with our presentation today. First, I'd like to welcome you all to the Rural Health Executive Educational Series. I am Cody Smith, Partnership Manager with the NRHA Service Corporation, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's presentation. Before we dive in, please note there is a short survey at the end of the session, and if you could take a minute to fill that out, it would be very helpful to us. Your feedback is so important to help us, helping us to refine and tailor future educational series to best serve your needs. A few housekeeping items to review. All attendees are muted during the webinar. We do like to get through our presentations in about 45 minutes, offering time at the end for questions. If you have a question for the presenter, please feel free to type that into the question section of your webinar control panel at any time, and we'll be sure we cover it. Finally, this event is being recorded and you will receive an email. Uh, it does say before the end of the day, sometimes it's the next day with a link to the recording. All right. Uh, today, we have the privilege of hearing from Amy Graham, Principal, and Ryan Brenneman, Consultant with Stroudwater Associates. Amy and Ryan are presenting Mastering Revenue Cycle KPIs, Essential Strategies for Rural Hospitals. Before we begin, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to our dedicated partner, Stroudwater Associates. We are so grateful for your continued support and industry expertise, which allows us to host conferences, educational webinars, and other events dedicated to improve, improving rural health care. Your support is crucial to our admission a mission of advancing rural health initiatives. Okay, without further ado, I will turn it over to Amy and Ryan for our feature presentation today. Hey, thanks, Cody. I greatly appreciate it. I appreciate NRHA for opening this forum up for us. And I also appreciate the people in the audience who wanted to learn about KPIs and what that means and what to look for in revenue cycle and things like that. So our objectives for today, we are, I'm going to let my colleague Ryan talk about KPIs, how they're used, what that means and things like that. We'll then work, look at how to develop some KPIs. We'll give you some examples and formulas as well as um, then leading into some best practices. Like, okay, I'm going to start tracking this information, but what does that really mean? Um, so that's what our objectives, that's what we're focusing on today. And when looking at that, let's really just talk about the KPIs. What is a KPI and how are they used? Well, if you have been in a webinar of mine or been in a meeting with mine or even listened to me talk, I love Revenue Cycle. And one of the things that I love about Revenue Cycle is that it is a multifaceted process. So you've probably seen this chart before where I talk about all of the activities that are encompassed in Revenue Cycle. Today, we are going to be in the far line of these columns. And when I think about the columns, if something's broken, it's a domino effect. It goes all the way through. And that's where we really lean on the analytics and this cleaning meaningful data. What does that really mean? How to focus on some process measures and financial measures? Why separate those into the two different categories? So that's really where we are. And if you were in our webinar last week or a week ago or so, a spoiler alert, we had trouble hearing from Ryan because of his microphone. Ryan, are you there? I, I am here. Can you still hear me? Oh, yes, we can. All right. So I'm going to, yay, Cody and I are cheering. And we're going to let Ryan just talk to us about the next slides going forward. Thanks, baby. So like I mentioned, we're going to start off really at the high level exactly. You know, what is a KPI? You know, a KPI or a key performance indicator is a measure of a specific item or objective over time. It measures financial health, stability, and trajectory, and it gives value for further decision making. Good KPIs, you'll see have four different types of, uh, you know, criteria there. They're actionable, directional, accurate, and measurable. So as we think about this and not getting too simple here, you know, what do your KPIs need to meet the criteria? Well, really it's the three words within KPI. They should be key, 
being they are tied to something that is important and worth paying attention to. They should be performance related, meaning they help understand how well some activity or activities are going within your business. And they should be an indicator, meaning that you can measure something that matters within RCM. You know, is this item functioning good? Is it going poorly? Is it improving? Is it regressing? So we'll get into examples, you know, shortly here, but this just really kind of sets the stage at a high level of what KPIs can do and how they you know, begin to help explain the, the health of a particular function or your RCM in general. So one other item um, or terminology really closely related to KPIs you may hear fairly often is OKRs or objectives and key results. You know, in comparison to your KPIs, your OKRs are usually reevaluated more frequently and kind of change more with your overall organizational objectives. You know, there may be a push um, from the executive leadership to be more patient friendly in the upcoming year, or, you know, we may need to put a greater focus on placing quality or, or something at a high level, something along those lines or more along what, what you consider OKRs to be. They tend to be a little more, I'd say, aspirational and a little more fluid over time. You know, OKRs in, in comparison to, to KPIs um, may more be directly associated with your organization's values or the current vision or possibly a response to a change in, in corporate attitude, something along those lines. But again, in comparison, your KPIs are more of a top-down, established criteria to measure ongoing performance, month to month, year to year, you know, date over date. Your, your KPIs tend to evaluate functional items of your business in your processes more so than, than OKRs would. And then again, generally speaking, you know, different hospitals and different revenue cycles may likely have different OKRs based on that top-down strategy, but in general, they should have somewhat similar KPIs, at least to an extent. So what we've kind of talked about what a KPI is, now we get to, you know, what is the purpose of these KPIs? First, they help in trending success of a process um, to show improvement or regression, like I mentioned before. Your, your KPIs give you a quick look to determine how you're moving, if you're showing improvement, are you moving in the right direction, et cetera. Second, your KPI should help establish a target for your team to strive for. As we will see later, as we kind of uh, talk about best practices, uh, those establishing a target or a goal for each metric you have, so your teams, one, know what the standards that they're trying to meet, and then two, exactly how close to that, that standard they're, they're getting as they move forward throughout the year. Another purpose for KPIs includes helping leaders make informed decisions that are based on data and be, be more objective in nature as, to, as opposed to being subjective. You know, I kind of think particularly in terms of maybe staffing decisions or, or system investments, things like that, KPIs are beneficial in that decision-making process. Um, they can help give a little more credence and evidence to revenue cycle decisions and are really beneficial to have that in your back pocket. And, and finally here, KPIs can help recognize process breakdowns or opportunities for improvement. Um, the most notable thing I can think of recently is I think of that change healthcare situation that's been plaguing so many people for the past, call it six or eight weeks now. You know, good KPIs around claim submission errors or claim acceptance rates could potentially have been that first indication that something had gone haywire within your organization. But even if they were not the first indication, having those KPIs may be critical in terms of quantifying how large of an issue you have and, and really resubmitting claims or, or getting those payments back in the door at a later process. So we've talked about exactly what a KPI is. So now we'll kind of get into where to start, how to develop those, especially if you have nothing in place to this point. So when you think about developing that KPI, a first key piece is really spending some time defining exactly what the metric is that you're looking at monitoring and be sure, be sure that you're detailing exactly how you intend to measure that. You know, you want, a, you want to be sure that this KPI, as you report it going forward, you obtain and measure that data the same way month to month, every period going forward. Um, the, the example we have provided here is around denial count. If you come to the, the determination that, you know what, we're going to start tracking denials on a monthly basis, you really need to start by defining exactly what you mean by denials. You know, specifically what number is your team or, or team member going to be pulling? And can they pull it the same way every month? Are you counting how many denied line items occur or how many invoices were denied or how many denial codes were posted? You know, these three items produce very different totals. And it's important to pull that data in the same way every period so that the numbers don't tell the wrong story or lead you down uh, you know, the wrong path, quite honestly. Yeah. Part of
part of this process, again, is to document how the data for the KPI is obtained. Is it pulled from a specific report or is it generated from a specific calculation that you have? But you need to define and document that process somewhere within your KPI reporting. You know, you want to define that KPI so well that someone else could come behind and replicate that exact same number and metric themselves, even if they hadn't done it in the past. So as you think about those first KPIs you want to put into place, you might select one to three for each functional area within your revenue cycle. You know, start small, but you want to make sure that you encompass all the areas of concern within your revenue cycle. You don't want all of your, your KPIs to just focus on you know, front-end claim submission and have nothing in place around denial management or, or vice versa. You know, choose those KPIs that align with your organizational goals and give the best insight for your team's success. You know, you want to track what matters and be as detailed as possible to exactly define what you consider to be success in each of those areas. So again, if you're going to start building KPIs, if you have nothing in place, you know, how and where do you start? We will kind of walk through that same idea as we mentioned before around tracking denials, but the idea is here is to begin building something and build upon it until it meets all of your needs. You know, something in place is better than nothing, even if it takes time to grow and develop into truly what you want to see as the end result. So what we have here is, is kind of, I'd say, four somewhat arbitrary levels described on the slide. You know, if you have nothing in place regards to KPIs around denials, maybe you start by just counting raw numbers, you know, received monthly. You know, again, defining exactly what you're counting, like we mentioned a few slides back. And after several months, you have a good feel for that. You kind of know where you're at. You have at least, you, you've developed a trend. And then maybe you progress to you know, level two here. So you start creating a percentage so that your volume changes and in, in, um, in claims doesn't really uh, have as, such an impact on the calculation. You know, maybe 8% of claims last month were denied and now, now it's 7%, something along those lines. You have a better feel as you, you grow from that level one to level two. You know, comparing this number month to month provides more value than just a raw number of denials saying, hey, we had 400 last month, we've got 420 this month. You know, those volume, that volume may have a significant impact on that. But even then, as you kind of reach that level two, we still can continue to build upon that work and move into these, again, arbitrary levels three and four, where we see more actionable data coming out and more detailed trends begin to emerge. You know, the number of monthly prior auth denials for a particular payer can be a great indicator of potential changes in their policy or changes in prior off requirements or, or potentially that, you know, you have a, a, a process that has potentially broken. So as you progress higher in these levels, um, there is more benefit. You know, again, you're getting a little more detailed. It, it may not be as such a, a flash in your face as, okay, a, a quick number, a quick understanding. And there may be, you know, more detail there than maybe your executive leadership needs but someone has to have that KPI and be able to get to that detail so that has something that they can work from and really has a good impact on how they work that AR. You know, trending items like this through KPI reports really helps to focus on the efforts of top concern and really make sure that your time is being spent most appropriately. So as we think about the value uh, of clean and consistent data like we, we see here, it really helps to establish a starting point of communication with your teams. You know, having that KPI that is consistent and clean data gives a metric that, that you can refer back to when having conversations or, or decisions regarding changes in behaviors. It can also give managers an understanding of the why simply behind some actions. You know, if you begin to see a, a drop in your cash collections, you can look to your KPIs and try to determine why. Is it caused by, you know, an increase in denials or a, a clean, a decrease in your um, accuracy of claims submitted, or you know maybe there's more prior offs not being obtained. But really having those KPIs in place starts understanding the why behind all of these actions. You know, um, similarly, you can use these KPIs to encourage team buy-in. You know, if you are making a decision to change someone's workflow, or maybe their scope of their work from a day-to-day -day basis, or, or change their primary focus, you know it is beneficial to have that data behind you that supports all of those changes. And then finally here, KPIs give vision and understanding and allow for faster course correction. When a metric starts deteriorating, you can see it quickly in black and white and make a decision based on the data. Let's try. It does not seem to be wanting to. There we go. Let's try. There we go. It was not wanting to go. Um, on the flip side, um, 
without consistent KPI data, you know, small problems can become bigger problems and lead to, to costly situations. You know, the first example I can think of is quite honestly your car dashboard. If the check engine light comes on, you probably want to at least take a minute or two to take a look at something before um, you know, something major potentially goes wrong. You know, if that temperature gauge is, is creeping upwards, maybe you just need to, to add some coolant. Do something small before the engine overheats and a bigger issue emerges. You know, smaller things like a lack of team engagement or inconsistent data can balloon into a larger issue if not recognized quickly and addressed. Um, you know, one of the biggest things I, I truly think that KPIs do is help with employee engagement and help them to recognize the connection between their work and the bottom line. Um, Amy and I have both worked in organizations where the employees, you know, they kind of work, come in, they do their workflows on a daily basis. You have team members completing their tasks, but after a while, um, what they're doing and how it is connected to the bottom line really kind of becomes lost and they become honestly detached from those financial results. You know, they kind of become numb to that true importance of what is being done in revenue cycle and the impact that their daily work um, may have on the organization. So to kind of combat that, one way or one thing I like to do is always kind of point back to that improvement in a certain area or that KPI or that metric from a month to month basis that may have been a result from their team efforts and really give them that data that supports that, hey, your efforts are making a difference and it's important that what you're working on, you know, again, has that impact on that bottom line. You know, when employees have that ability to connect the dots between their efforts and the success of the organization, that's really when those lights go on and, and those, those big ideas and those big things really start to happen. You know, when that employee engagement and team understanding of the big picture occurs, those larger issues ha have, have a bigger, better chances of being avoided and, and those costly situations, you know, being missed. So again, kind of, kind of stemming from that, when effective KPIs are present, actions happen. You know, the, the title here says that when effective KPIs are pr present, but I would really say that when effective KPIs are embraced by the team, then, then, then is when action actually happens. So think of these items here kind of as a roadmap uh, for what your team needs to be reviewing and kind of looking at from a KPI perspective. When you have KPIs in place, everyone has the same version of truth, the same roadmap to see where you've been, kind of where you're heading and where you're planning on going. You know, successes and opportunities are easier to see. And there's factual data available to be used to engage other departments. I really look at KPIs as a good way to make something that may be somewhat subjective into a more concrete, you know, black and white answer. Your KPIs become a good justification for a lot of the decisions that your team may need to make. So again, following these roadmap items really begins to help you create an environment built on data and analytics. You know, the fourth bullet point here is, is pretty important, though, is if you're going to build an environment that is data-driven and analytic, analytical, the focus has to be on addressing problems and not nitpicking on the data. So errors in reporting or doubts around the accuracy of your information can really hamstring the success of a data-driven environment. It really kind of puts a, you know, again, ham hamstrings that, that idea of KPIs being an effective tool within your, your tool belt. But if an agreement can be made on the data, then that's when you start to see those positive actions and greater efficiencies and greater engagement across the organization. So we've kind of talked through, you know, the effective uses of KPIs, the value of them, what they are, but now we're going to get into some examples of a KPI dashboard and exactly what it can be used for. So what we have here, I would say, is an example of a, a standard KPI dashboard, a fairly basic one um, generated with an Excel, but even on this basic kind of you know, template here, we can see a few critical items. Number one, each KPI is listed in that first column. Um, normally when I would put together something like this, each item would also have directly next to it, or maybe in the comments section, you know, how and when that data was pulled. For example, the first one here, cash collections, it, it may be as detailed as the billing manager pulls the cash report out of this system on this day, you know, the day after close, and then reports the total found on the summary of page four, five, whatever it is, the bottom of the report. You, know, you really want to document, uh, I go back to kind of those elementary news reporter questions, who, what, where, when, why, on how each of these numbers is generated. So now that you have that number, the, the second item we'll see here is that each metric has a defined goal. We have a, a documented target that we are shooting for. You know, these goals may change over time, 
but at least as the as the timing of the report is published, you know, we all know exactly what we're aiming for, we're aware of the goal, and we have the same target, you know, in our sites. And then the third thing we'll see here on this dashboard, um, not really as a big of a requirement, but more of a nice to have, is that we have that color indicator, that red, yellow, green, as to how we are doing. Are, are we meeting the expectation? Are we, are we getting close to it, but not quite there? Or are we so far off that it needs to be red, it needs to be a, a high priority going into the next several months? You know, th this red, yellow, green kind of stoplight mentality gives an idea of overall success. You know, like this bullet point says here, the last one, what is placed in this KPI report should be agreed upon throughout the entire team. And it, it can be used to help determine where focus is going forward. It doesn't simplify the overall revenue cycle process by any stretch of the imagination, but it does help to summarize and highlight those areas that are being, quite honestly, the best successes or where there is the, the most opportunity going forward. So we, we think about the reports in place to kind of monitor RCM. Um, what, what we're talking about there are those things that are involved in the claim life cycle. So kind of that, that arrow that is poking to the left. You know, these are the process, made, process measures that help us to explain you know, the, how the hospital or clinic AR is performing. These are separate from the reporting measures in place for finance, such as the general ledger or, or the P&L, but they are significantly tied to each other and do have a significant impact on those financial reports. You know, again, you see those areas, those arrows are tied together and really they're pointing in opposite directions, but but what occurs on your AR clearly has an impact to that, that general ledger and that bottom line. So, you know, keep in mind that those those KPIs that correlate strongly to the, that general ledger, the, that bottom line, your P&L, those are things that you may want to focus heavily on when you start to develop that KPI dashboard and which measures um, you'll focus on in that claim life cycle. So as we start to think about those reports, we, what we have here are some of those reports that are just examples from a pre-claim through front end perspective. Again, as you consider implementing any of these, know how you will pull this data, keep in mind how each of these has an impact on your overall cash collections to your bottom line, um, you know, items like point of service collections here. You know, really consider how much your patient's copay or deductible responsibilities have gone up over the last several years. And if you have a reporting mechanism in place to handle that burden and those changes. You know, beginning to trend these type of numbers over the course of several months can give indication of whether or not any changes in your process need to occur. Really gives you that first indication of what's going on and the health of that organization or that piece of your organization in that department. Similarly, on this next slide, as we move from the pre-claim and the front end, we, we have very similar reporting examples on the back end, you know, we have a handful of reports here that are more focused on transaction processing and AR management. These are more, again, your back end revenue cycle processes give you an indication of how denial management success is going. Again, overall RCM health. Um, the first one here, I think of days in AR is really one of your, your key milestone KPIs to measure. And again, as you set goals for this, uh, this, this metric and any of the others, you may want to honestly see just quite honestly where you are currently before you sort of hit that goal and that benchmark and put that in place. You know, if your days in AR is currently hovering around 100, maybe a goal of 75 or 80 is a good intermediate goal for the next six or eight months. And then after you hit that goal, you begin to work down towards that 45 or 50, which is more of that standard benchmark for the, for the hospital and, and revenue cycle. You know, part of the 10 of the KPIs is really showing trajectory how are you moving? What, direct, what direction are you moving? And many of these metrics are quite honestly not easy to turn around overnight. So just keep that in mind and be aware that you may need some intermediate goals, you know, in, in, in the place before you hit that ultimate, you know, final destination where you actually want to end up. So from a calculation perspective, I think these are here more for your reference once this presentation is distributed. But just to be aware of how many of these items are calculated and to be sure that when discussing internally with your teams and other leaders, that everyone is on the same page of exactly what you mean when you're discussing a metric. You know, even some of these that are listed here have pretty standard calculations, but there is some variation available. Um, again, for example, days in AR, most organizations, or I say many, use a 90-day rolling time frame, but some calculations may use 60 days or 120 or, or potentially even 180. So just be aware of that. 
um, and be consistent with your method methodology, what you've chosen to to use as your your calculation, and stick to that as you move forward throughout your your course of um, defining your KPIs. So from a HFMA perspective, HFMA has created a math key initiative to assist in key performance indicators around revenue cycle. These math keys are in five major category groups, um, including patient access, free billing, claims, account resolution, and financial management. Um, as an example, the, the MAP termino terminology is a three-letter acronym for measure, apply, and perform. And we have provided the link here for more information around the standard and the benchmarks that HFMA is using. So there are some opportunities within that MAP initiative for peer comparison on many of their metrics or benchmarking and some other items as well. So just be aware of that option that is available through HFMA. And again, the link will be provided when this presentation is distributed. So I've done the fun part of covering all of the, <laughs> the what is a KPI, how do you develop it, what can it be used for? I'm going to hand it over to Amy to discuss some of the KPI best practices. Hey, Ryan, I appreciate you for, for doing that. And, um, you know, when thinking about the KPIs and looking at it, we I used to, when I talk about it, be like, here's what HFMA says. It's 29 different measures out there. And I really like the fact that, you know, what Ryan shared is there are a few ones, you know, when looking at that dashboard, there are only about 10 or maybe 11 that are five process indicators and five financial indicators that you're looking at. So don't think that it's an overwhelming chore to, you know, to just put this in place if you don't have anything. One of the best practices is just to start. So if we go to the next slide, Ryan, some of the K, the best practices out there are to really use the data. As Ryan shared on that one screen, you want to embrace the results. So you want to have monthly revenue cycle meetings where you just review what's out there. And, you know, what did your performance do? Did it go up? Did it go down? Why is it going up? Why is it going down? Um, and then look at a benchmark against industry standards. Uh, when looking at it, we do know that in some areas, you know, rule has a different standard than um, than other areas do. But I would say when you're looking at like your overall days in AR, that 45 days out there, that's pretty much industry wide. You may have some locations that it's a little more than that with, um, let's say, your swing bed days and things like that. Those claims do take a little longer to, to be collected and all. However, when looking at it, there are industry benchmarks that you can use and trend them over time. And then also when looking at this data, develop an environment that is data driven and driven to improving performance. That when you start looking at some of these measures, really getting into, you know, what caused it, what happened, what can we do to drive it, drive that improvement upstream? Um, when I showed you the first slide and said it's a domino effect, it could be that some of your measures on the back end are directly related to improvements that need to happen up front with scheduling and registration, and that if you capture those, then over time you will see an improvement in those. But you really want to, you know, have that environment that um, partners with each other and you are using the data to drive the improvements, not the blame and not the finger pointing, which is very easy to do in revenue cycle, but to really look at the benchmark trends and what does that data say. Part of the other best practices that are out there on our next slide, you know, really establish who, when, and how the data is obtained. Ryan said it when he was looking at that key indicator dashboard and showing you the example of that. It was this employee pulls it on this date at this time of the, you know, this day of the month. Here's when they pull it because there are some reports that cannot be reproduced. Um, when thinking about like unapplied cash, you pull it at a specific time every single month because the minute your cash posters go in and post that cash, it's no longer unapplied. So there are some reports that you wanna look at 
on a daily basis, what do you have as unapplied cash? Uh, what are your bills submitted, claims submitted that haven't been done? There are other metrics, though, that you might want to look at on a weekly basis or monthly. What does, you know, what is your AR? One of the most fun discussions I have is when I talk to an accounting, an accountant versus talking to a revenue cycle person. Um, an accountant talks about AR as of the end of the month, whereas you talk to someone who's in revenue cycle and they're telling you the AR balance as of that day and making sure that that reported, that reporting cadence is consistent and really stick to it again. Can't, some reports, unapplied cash is one of them, unbilled receivables. Once the, your team goes to work, that report number has changed. So you really want to establish that consistent cadence and keep that in place. And then when using these KPIs, really look at the KPIs to track the trends and anomalies. So like in this example, I'm showing you a current period versus a prior period. And this was from June of 22 and July of 22. So the month end was closed. It was July. We closed it, had net AR days of 17. Oh, wasn't that a fabulous, <laughs> fabulous number out there? Uh, you can see these were like a little made up. But then you look at the cash collections as a percent of net services revenue. And it looks like it went down by 15%. And you're like, oh my goodness, what does this mean? Well, really, if you look at the next month, if you look at it in a different way where you are looking at the current month, the current year versus the prior year, so you look at July of 2022 versus July of 2021, you can see that cash collections, it actually is better than it was last year. So while it may have gone down and you're like ready to be like, oh, what's happening? You go back and look at it and say, no, we're actually doing better on cash collections than we were this time last year. And so in comparing that, but you might want to start paying attention though to bad debt. Why did your bad debt go from 19 to 20? It's starting to go up, but then when you're looking at it from 20, you know, over the prior year, it's substantially gone up. So it could be that there is something taking place. And then the last one to look at is when you look at the current period versus the prior period year in. And so, Ryan, on that one, we can see that, you know, cash collections has actually gone up since December of 2021. And it could be you had this great initiative to do co-pays and deductibles, collecting all of that and a real big initiative. And the cash was high at the beginning of the year, but it's starting to taper off now that July is here because people have met that copay and deductible and there's not as high a cash collection on it. But then I would also pay attention to that bad debt. While it didn't look so bad going up one per, you know, going up in June over July, it has substantially gone up over year over year and is continuing to increase as of the prior year end. And that would be the fiscal year end for the organization. So you really want to start tracking those trends and tracking the anomalies to see what does this look like period over period, period, you know, compared to different ones, because I will tell you a single month that's not a trend to make. You do need to look at the look at the information and really dig into it. And some of the ways to really spot these trends and anomalies is to look at, you know, just ask questions, um, you know, three times. That's one of the Six Sigma mantras is to ask why three times. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Because it could be that it's not until you get to the third time that you find out, oh, this is why bad debt is going up because, you know, it could be bad debt's going up. Well, why is it going up? Well, we did a big write-off. Well, why did you do a big write-off? Well, we were cleaning up the AR system. Well, why were you cleaning up the AR system? Well, when we transitioned from our old EHR to our new EHR, those that AR has aged out. That's why we're writing it off. And it's like, oh, okay, that answers why that is happening. Another way to investigate it is looking at the information differently. Is there a specific, you know, aging buckets? Definitely looking at your aging buckets and see, is there a specific payer that stands out? And is this an annual trend for that payer? 
Um, for those of you in Illinois, you probably recognize this statement because I've worked in multiple organizations that um, the state of Illinois, they have their budget period. It ends in um, October, so all of my receivables build up that last quarter of the Illinois budget year, and I just know this payer is starting to grow. It's starting to grow. Do I need to worry? I'm going to keep an eye on it, but I know that my Medicaid money isn't going to come in until closer to when they accept the budget for the next year. And then once they do, I know, yes, October, all my money comes in, and there it is. So I hope that there's some of you in the audience that are shaking your head because you know what I'm talking about. It's There's a specific payer that just they pay on a specific cadence, and you need to know. I'm going to monitor this, but if it doesn't fall on that cadence, that's when you need to, you know, speak up and just, but really look at your information differently, looking at it by payer and is it a trend and those type of things. But then also don't just focus on the financial areas. You know, sometimes you need to look at the entire process to identify the root cause and say, has there been an operational change? Like one of those areas would be medical necessity or prior authorizations, sometimes the change that occurred is because there was somebody in a clinical area that used to get the prior authorizations, but they won the lottery. They've now decided they're going to stay at home and not, and not work for your organization anymore. And because of that, that role was open. And that was a piece of the puzzle that didn't get transitioned over. And so was there an operational change that could have caused medical, you know, your prior authorizations to go up because that role hasn't been filled? That don't just focus on, oh, we have this problem with prior authorization denials, but really look back to see why did that happen and where did it occur? And then finally on this one, I would just say the first answer isn't always the only answer. Um, I'm a little strange in that I think that's what's so much fun about Revenue Cycle because, um, you know what, multiple factors are in play. And that means that I get to work with multiple, organiz multiple departments within the organization to try and find the answer to just what is happening and what is going on and what do we need to do to fix it. And so just realize, though, that the first answer isn't always the only answer out there. And so continuing to ask why and find out what's at play. Um, I would go back to, oh, right, if we could go back to that one for just a, a minute, that with that first answer not being the only answer, like right now, you may not see your charges coming through because some of you are closing the month of March and looking at your numbers and it's like, oh, what's going on? It's not, you know, it's something not happening. And it could be that, you know, change healthcare is down. That's why we couldn't submit any claims. That's why our unbuild has grown high. But then also look to say, our, you could have a physician, though, that didn't um, close out all of his claims, his cases for the month. And so he's got, a, you know, he was on vacation and now he's back or the physician's back. And you have two areas that are at play that are causing your unbilled receivables to increase. So that would just be, you know, first answer may be a problem, but it could be that there is another answer out pl in play there. Some of the things, too, um, when looking at it, so we can go to the next slide, Ryan. In this, you know, just vendor involvement with your KPI success. Some of you may be saying, but Amy, I have my home office takes care of this, or I have a third party that takes care of it, or, you know, here this organization does this, and I've outsourced a portion of that. What do I need to do? Do I really even care about KPIs? And I would say, yes, you do. You want to implement regular vendor reviews, vendor performance reviews. You know, are they meeting your service level? What's the timeline for deliverable? When, you know, when thinking about not many people thought about change healthcare until all of a sudden their system went down and all of a sudden we're like, oh, you we use you for that. You know, to have those proactive discussions with your vendors and really talk to them about it. Um, if you are part of a home office in a company works with that, well, if you're in a system that has larger hospitals as well as rural facilities, 
really hold them accountable to making sure that they are paying as much attention to your hospital's claims as they are to the bigger, larger facilities within your organization. Because Ryan and I talk about it a lot. It's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. And they're going to look at the large dollar claims, but your smaller dollar claims are just as important. You want to look at, you know, analyzing analytics, you know, what are actionable items that they can take care of, and then what is that vendor doing? Do they, do you have oversight and accountability with clear expectations as to what they should do? And then finally, establishing points of contact and then anticipated staff involvement. If you use this third-party organization to manage your accounts receivable, how much of that work comes back to your local staff to resolve? Do they take care of 100% of it? Or are there areas where they're reaching out to engage your physician in answering some of the questions? What does that communication look like? Do you have that involvement with them? And are you managing that responsibility with them. So just to really establish that point of contact, what do they need to escalate? What should they be bringing to your attention? Um, and then also a timeline around that. How much time do they expect for you to get an answer back to them? Are they being the squeaky wheel and they're like, give me my answer in two hours and you're like, oh, I have a patient standing in front of me that I need to take care of. I'll get you that response within 24 hours. What does that look like? What is the appropriate level of involvement and expectation there? And going on to our next area, just looking at the value of KPIs within payer contracting. Oh, this, you know, we have all talked about Medicare Advantage and payers who are not paying and payers who are paying and, you know, prior authorization denials, medical necessity. If you are tracking, this information and monitoring it, then what you can do is come back and say to them, hey, you may think you are giving us this great contract, but let me tell you what your contract value actually is and bring to the table what their denial reporting is. How often are they requesting medical records? What's their appeal process? If you have KPIs in place, this is where you can take that information and go back to the payers and sit down at the table and go, here's the data, here are the facts and figures. We are not going to fight over this. We are going to tell you, you are not holding up your edge end of the bargain. Or you may have a payer that's just great and you may want to call them and go, you know what? You may be bad to everybody else, but for us, you're really good and we just want to say thank you. You know, using, okay, a girl can have a dream, Ryan, but I'm looking at sorry, it, sorry. you know, yeah, you know, we hope that that would happen, um, but then coming back and saying, you know, here's the financial health of this contract. This contract has been yielding this, and how do you know that information? You know that because you are tracking the KPIs within your organization, and then you have taken that information and really drilled down to a payer level to be able to come back to them and say, here's where you stand. This is what we are dealing with on a day in and day out basis. Fix it, make it right. Or we will, we are going to continue, we are going to renegotiate this contract to account for the fact that you had, you know, you denied this percent of our claims and your medical necessity, you downgrade for this piece of it and giving them the facts in the claim data that ties to that. And then finally, within KPIs, one of the things that we were, we've were we been talking about is just calculating this month over month, period over period. But you can actually use your KPIs to develop a daily rate, looking at your claims submitted, how many claims have been accepted, what does that look like on a daily basis, your, re, your rejected pre-registration rate, your cash collections, because one of the things that's really been brought to the forefront recently is that change healthcare has gone down. You know, they've had this issue. Your systems have hit a speed bump of sorts. And to be able to take your KPIs and say, this is what our daily rate is for submitting claims. You've been down now for more than 30 days. 
here's the value related to that. And then working with payers on that, working with your clearinghouse to say, we need a better rate because this is what we're seeing going through. Here is the average of daily claims. Because I will say that when you probably entered into the relationship with your clearinghouse or even other system vendors, you may not have had this information on a daily basis. But if you have developed a KPI atmosphere where you are really in an environment where you're really tracking this information, you can take this data and go back to them and say, we monitor this. This is how we are using this in our processes. And we need you to help us out and provide us with um, additional information related to that. And we expect you to come to the table and work with us on that and see, you know, and then hold fast to it because you have the data and this is the information that you are sharing with them. So with that, that does get us to um, the last section of our uh, presentation with Q&As. And so, uh, Cody, I would say that if you have received any questions or if you want to type it into the question box, we are more than happy to help answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, absolutely. So we've had a couple um, requests for slides come in. And Amy, I don't know if you and Ryan want to share your contact information in the uh, chat. That way people can reach out if they want. Um, oh, perfect. That's well, even yeah, better. We have a slide. So what are we, so we, I, and we did do it with a handy dandy QR code so that you don't have to type this into the phone. You can either scan it for myself or for Ryan. And with that, it should bring you to our page on the Strawwater website. There's a little name badge. If you click that name badge on your phone, it brings up our contact information and you could just save it on your phone right there. Um, and my family is always gracious when you call me to talk about revenue cycle because that means I'm not talking about it to them and I'm more than happy to have somebody else work on getting all of my words out for the day as well. So Ryan, <laughs> I can't speak for your family, but um, both of us are just happy to talk to you anytime that you'd like. My oh, wife just I gives me a glazed over look. <laughs> <laughs> I know that look. <laughs> Um, I did have a question come in from Jen Crocker, and I'm, I'm going to take her off mute because she she's asking a couple of things that I don't want to get wrong. Um, Jen, if that's okay, I'm going to ask to unmute you, and then you can um, ask your very specific questions so that I don't mess it up for you. Great. Thanks so much. So, Amy, my question was related to the data when we look at benchmarking or setting goals for our own organization. Do you know where we can go for free data or resources to help us inform our benchmarking or, or decisions related to goals? Because as you mentioned, there are a couple of things to consider. You know, what's realistic if you're starting at 99 days, maybe think about 75. But I'm also thinking, you know, I'd like to know what's industry standard, you know, depending on am I a hospital, am I an ambulatory surgical center, am I a mixed provider practice with multiple specialties, depending on what you are. Um, but just trying to figure out where I can go for data outside of my organization without having to pay for a subscription to access that data. Oh, see, yeah, I had an answer for me, for you, and then it, and then you threw in the kicker of the well, subscription. You know. Yeah, so here's what I would say. For the rural community, feel free to reach out to either Ryan and I, and we can share with you the benchmarks that we use within Stroudwater. Where I hesitate on that kicker is I have not gone and looked, but I the HFMA map keys is a good starting point and one of the reasons why I like it and I don't think that there is a subscription for pulling their data I they actually have different categories where they have critical access hospitals major metropolitan hospitals um, ASCs they have different categories within their information and then they share who their top performers are they have awards that they give out and that data is public is out there, um, and and that's what I like about those map keys. Now, if you want to participate in their program, that is a, sub a subscription, and I'm not necessarily um, saying that you should do. I think that you can build a KPI structure 
on your own and just start with one or two measures and then proceed from there. But that's where I have found the best comparative information so that it those different categories, they do pr produce a list of here, their winners of their awards in that map key. And then you can look to them and go, oh, that critical access hospital did it at 35, you know, days, uh, days in AR versus my hospital does it at 85, that type of thing. Um, I find that's the best. And then there are other organizations out there that, um, that share that information and we're happy to you know discuss what we look at for Stroudwater and I would and Ryan if you want to go back to um that one slide where we had the sample with the red blue and or the red blue and green the red yellow and green um it's on slide 16 so going to slide 16 we actually do share on this slide did I get it on 16 with the KPI dashboard that one, there you go. So mm -hmm. those are the goals that we typically use when looking at rural facilities of what standards are out there. So happy to chat with you about that. That's what we use for these key metrics on if you are operating in this, then you have a, you know, if you are meeting these metrics, then that's what we consider to be standard within the rural community. And looking at what calculated there and what those goals are set on, would you agree that those are based on the HFFA map key definition of those metrics? Um, the definition, the, the def, I would say that is what we see in industry experience, not based on the map keys. Okay. They are, our goals are a little, are different from the map key ones. Um, but we do use, Ryan, if we go to slide 20, um, we do have the calculations mm -hmm. um, for that that tell you how we calculate what we use as the standard to get to that to get to those numbers. Thank you. And I will tell you that is a common question out there. It's like, where are benchmarks? <laughs> you know, and um, I, ha I have seen that. Um, out there, you know, just what is it and what does that look like? And also what, what's right for me, right? That's also an organization exactly. decision. Right. And what's right. For, and that's one of those that like if, if in looking at days in gross AR and days in net AR, for some organizations, you keep your AR at net. And in other organizations, you keep your AR at gross. And so based on that would determine if there is a, if you should use both of those calculations or only one of them. Thank you so much. We did have another question come in. Um, what from Patrick? What are the top three KPIs that hospital CFOs should share with the hospital board of directors throughout the fiscal year? I laugh because I was talking with the CFO the other day um, and uh, they were like, well, I'm not going to show that one to my board because it didn't look good this month. <laughs> you know? So, um, no, I would say the financial measures on this slide that Ryan is sharing, those uh, three, six, seven ones would be the ones that I would share. Um, maybe charity is not a big item within your organization, um, but I would share those. Um, in some of the areas like percentage of unbilled, the reason why you would want to share that is if you have a medical staff problem where you have um, offending physicians. Now, I know you don't have that at all, but I'm just saying that and everybody in running cycles rolling their eyes because there's always one offender at every facility um, that just doesn't complete their they don't close their charts and that makes your unbilled receivable go up and impacts it. That Those would be the ones that I would share with a board um, to start getting them used to the fact that that is what you are looking at. The other one I would um, then as they start getting comfortable with that, I think I would throw in a denials management, maybe looking at some specific payers as to what they are, um, the claims that they are denying, and do you have a problem with a payer? Okay. 
I don't have any other questions in here right now, but if you do have something you'd like to ask, go ahead and raise your hand or put it in the chat panel and we will be sure to get to it. Um, Ryan, I know if you want to put your contact information back up, I did have another request for slides. Um, so I want to make sure everybody has your information and can reach out to you with any questions and information um, needed. As a reminder, a recording will be sent of this presentation today. Um, it will either be later this afternoon or tomorrow. I don't have control of that. I apologize. It just depends on when everything downloads, uh, but you will get a recording. So, okay. Again, I don't have any other questions at this time. We do have a couple minutes. If you, if you have something you want to ask, go ahead and do so. Amy, I will turn it back over to you for closing remarks. I just want to say thank you so much for your time today, um, Cody, for NRHA sponsoring this event, and then also for the participants in the organization. Um, KPIs are that area, especially within revenue cycle, that it can definitely impact the financial health of your organization. And you will see great improvements if you just start focusing on one and adding to it. So I uh, just want to say thank you and feel free as always to reach out to either myself or Ryan or anyone within Stroudwater should you have any questions about helping you all do your job better. So thank you. Okay. Ryan, anything to add today? No, I think that was a, a great summary by Amy. I appreciate everyone's time. And again, uh, no, I, I think we're, we're good. All right, sorry, I'm typing out an email address right now. <laughs> and then, um, I'm just, thank you, Amy, thank you, Ryan, for uh, everything today. As always, great information, Stroudwater, we appreciate your partnership with NRHA, one of our favorite partners. You're always a wealth of knowledge, and I know you mean a lot um, to our members, and we appreciate all your presence at our events. Don't forget, annual conference is right around the corner, so if you've not registered yet, please do so. We can't wait to see you all there. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. We hope you found this presentation informative and engaging. As a reminder, recording will be sent later today or tomorrow uh, before you leave. Also, please take a moment to complete that short survey at the end. Your insights are so valuable in helping us to um, create future content for our presentations. All right. And I will that being said, Oh, I was going to put Go one right more in. plug in there. Um, if you are at the conference in New Orleans for the NRHA, I will be there. Feel free to come by and say, hey, happy to see you and chat with you more about this. So, Cody, really looking forward to that conference as well. So, thank you. Yes, absolutely. I, I am too. I love seeing everybody there. It's always a great time um, and a really well-attended conference. So, if you haven't come yet, please please take a look and we'd love to see you there. All right. Everyone have a safe day and hope we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Thank you.